Hello friends, this is Vision Overseas. We are providing both online and offline coaching with most repeated and authentic practice material. Once you join our coaching, you will be updated with latest practice material for next quarter. If you have any question or query, you can visit our website thevisionoverseas.com and even you can contact us on given WhatsApp number for more details. Thank you. There are some 250 million cars in America, 250 million cars in a country with just over 300 million people. And most of those vehicles, of course, are gas powered. This poses a huge challenge given the limited supplies of oil and the growing urgency of the global warming crisis. But there's good news, according to our guests today, and that is we have the know-how and the technology to build sleek, fast automobiles that don't use gasoline. These vehicles of tomorrow are powered by hydrogen, electricity, biofuels, and digital technology, and they already exist. So what's stopping us from putting them on the roads? Our guest today will help answer that. Rebuilding carbon-rich agriculture soils is the only real productive, permanent solution to taking excess carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. She's frustrated that scientists and politicians don't see the same opportunities she sees. This year, Australia will emit just over 600 million tons of carbon. We can sequester 685 million tons of carbon by increasing soil carbon by half a percent on only 2% of the farms. If we increased it on all of the farms, we could sequester the whole world's emissions of carbon. What is nanotechnology? Well, a report that was put together by a combination of the Royal Society and the Royal Academy of Engineering that came out last summer, identifies two topics. Nanoscience as the study of phenomena and the manipulation of materials at atomic, molecular and macromolecular scales, where properties differ significantly from those as a larger scale. Nanotechnologies are the design characterization, production and application of structures, devices and systems by controlling shape and size at the nanometer scale. So I'll talk a little bit more in a moment about what a nanometer is, but loosely speaking people think of nanotechnologies as being a sort of 100 nanometers or less. These two paintings, both called sunflowers, are generally accepted as the finest of several depictions of the thick-stemmed, nodding blooms that Van Gogh made in 1888 and 1889 during his time in Arles. The first is now in the collection of the National Gallery in London, and the second is in the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam. Van Gogh referred to this work as a repetition of the London painting. But art historians and curators have long been curious to know how different this repetition is from the first. Should it be considered a copy, an independent artwork or something in between? An extensive research project conducted over the past three years by conservation experts at both the National Gallery and the Van Gogh Museum has concluded that the second painting was not intended as an exact copy of the original example, said Ella Hendricks, a professor of conservation and restoration at the University of Amsterdam, who was the lead researcher on the project. Along the way, we have built unashamedly beautiful buildings, two of which have won and been runner-up in the prestigious United Nations World Habitat Award, the first time an Australian building has received that international honor. 
We rely on older concepts of Australian architecture that are heavily influenced by the bush. All residents have private verandas which allow them to socialize outdoors and also create some defensible space between their bedrooms and public areas. We use a lot of natural or soft materials and build beautiful landscape gardens. Now that story has been scotched as a part of a contingency planning, but it was a symptom of the dramatic turn of events in South Australia, and it flushed out other remarks from water academics and people like Tim Flannery, indicating that things were really much worse than had been foreshadowed even earlier this year. So is Adelaide, let alone some whole regions of South Australia, in serious bother? Considering that the vast amount of its drinking water comes from the beleaguered, Miri, something many of us outside the state may not have quite realized. Is there a predicament, something we have to face up to as a nation? Lawrence Stephen Lowry RBS Raw was an English artist. Many of his drawings and paintings depict Pendlebury, Lancashire, where he lived and worked for more than 40 years, and also Salford and its surrounding areas. Lowry is famous for painting scenes of life in the industrial districts of northwest England in the mid-20th century. He developed a distinctive style of painting and is best known for his city landscapes peopled with human figures often referred to as matchstick man. He painted mysterious unpopulated landscapes, brooding portraits and the unpublished Naranet works, which were only found after his death. Brooke and her colleague Mark Newman studied who swapped messages with whom on a popular online dating platform in the month of January 2014. They categorized users by desirability using PageRank, one of the algorithms behind search technology. Essentially, if you receive a dozen messages from desirable users, you must be more desirable than someone who receives the same number of messages from average users. And then they asked, how far out of their league do online daters tend to go when pursuing a partner? I think people are optimistic realists. In other words, they found that both men and women tended to pursue mates just 25 percent more desirable than themselves. So they're being optimistic, but they're not they're They're also um, taking into account their own relative position within this overall desirability hierarchy. And the study did have a few more lessons for people on the market. I think one of the take-home messages from the study is women could probably afford to be more aspirational in their mate pursuit. Financial markets swung wildly yesterday in frenzied trading market by further selling of equities and fears about an unraveling of the global carry trade. At the same time, trading in the European credit markets in London was exceptionally heavy as traders frantically reassessed their appetites for risk, prompting wild swings in the prices of key derivatives. It was the third day of frantic activity in the European credit markets, suggesting that equity market swings were prompting a wider repositioning of investors in a host of asset classes. For many years, the favorite horror story about abrupt climate change was that a shift in ocean currents could radically cool Europe's climate. These currents, called the overturning circulation, bring warm water and warm temperatures north from the equator to Europe. Susan Luzier, an oceanographer at Duke University, says scientists have long worried that this ocean circulation could be disrupted.
In animals, a movement is coordinated by a cluster of neurons in the spinal cord called the central contract pattern generator CPG. This produces signals that drive muscles to contract rhythmically in a way that produces running or walking, depending on the pattern of pulses. A simple signal from the brain instructs the CPG to switch between modes such as going from a standstill to walking. Well, in 2004, we integrated ticketing in South East Queensland, so we introduced a paper uh, ticket that allowed you to travel across all the three modes in South East Queensland, so bus, train and ferry. And the second stage of uh, integrated ticketing is the introduction of a smart card. And the smart card will enable people to store value, uh, so to, to put uh, value on the card and then to use the card for travelling around the system. For all his fame and celebration, William Shakespeare remains a mysterious figure with regards to personal history. There are just two primary sources for information on the Bard, his works and various legal and church documents that have survived from Elizabethan times. Naturally, there are many gaps in this body of information, which tells us little about Shakespeare the man. We miscommunicate more commonly than we communicate accurately. Often the words we have are at least somewhat inadequate to express how we feel. The first words we think of are often poor reflections of what we really mean. We might at times even want to take our words back for a second attempt. But once those words have left our mouths, our partners are already replying to whatever we have just said. Most conversations happen too fast to allow us to figure out what we really meant to say. People rarely translate another person's unique way of saying things with any degree of accuracy. This is because when we learn the meaning of words, we pick up their broad meanings, but we've added subtle shades of difference which we get from our own personal experiences. If you grew up in an aggressive household, the phrase, I'm angry with you, had different associations than for a person from a family where people talked through problems – we're left having to work out meaning from our own experience. So despite the fact that, say, Bob and Gina are both speaking English, Bob is really speaking Bob English and Gina is turning that into Gina English. And the translation is never going to be perfect. We'll look now at a very interesting study. It was carried out by a researcher who works in two countries, Scotland and Italy, and it involved children from both of these countries aged around nine or so. Half of the children from each country spoke only their national language. However, the other half spoke their national language plus another language. During the study, all the participants were given tests and quizzes, which looked at a range of skills, including vocabulary understanding, problem solving, creative thinking and arithmetic. The children used their national language to complete the tasks, which involved things like copying patterns of coloured blocks, orally repeating a series of numbers and giving clear definitions of words. The results were quite clear. 
the bilingual children were significantly more successful in the tasks. A really good illustrative example of the point I want to make is the book Journey Cake Ho by Ruth Sawyer, based on a traditional folk tale. Teachers often read this aloud to their classes, showing the pictures to the children as they do so. They are, of course, using the words of Ruth Sawyer and presenting the story just as the artist has visualized it. But other teachers do it differently. Instead of reading, they tell the story from memory. This gives the children a much richer experience. They can freely use their own imaginations, visualizing the story, the characters, and the scenes in their mind's eye in any way they like. And this is much closer to the way in which folk tales were passed from generation to generation, orally, without any words or pictures to restrict the imagination. The effect of the first difference is, on the one hand, to refine and enlarge the public views by passing them through the medium of a chosen body of citizens whose wisdom may be discerned the true interests of their country and whose patriotism and love of justice will be least likely to sacrifice it to temporary or partial considerations. Under such a regulation, it may well happen that the public voice pronounced by the representatives of the people will be more consonant to the public good than if pronounced by the people themselves, convened for the purpose. Those of you who've never heard of the term Neo-Latin may be forgiven for thinking it's a new South American dance craze. If you're puzzled when I tell you it has something to do with the language of Romans, take heart. Over the years, many classes who have confessed they are not really sure what it is either. Some have assumed that they are so-called Late Latin, written at the end of the Roman Empire. Others have supposed it must have been something to do with the Middle Ages. Or perhaps it's that Pseudo-Latin, which my five- and seven-year-old boys seem to have gleaned from the Harry Potter books, useful for spells and curses that they zip one another with makeshift paper ash ones. No, in fact, Neo-Latin is more or less the same as the Latin that was written in the ancient world, classic Latin. So what's so new about it? The ocean has been getting bluer, according to a study published in the journal Nature. But that's not really good news for the planet. It means that the plants that give the ocean its green tint aren't doing well. Scientists say that because the ocean has been getting warmer. consumer, you're probably consuming imports. If we have a trade war and we start slapping tariffs on all of those imports, the bill is going to be higher. If the world relies so much on trade, what is a trade war? And why do countries get caught up in them in the first place? So a virus is something that you can't see by normal light microscopy. You need very advanced techniques of electron microscopy to see it. But that virus is not able to reproduce itself without a host. And us as human beings are made up of lots of different cell types. 
And we are interested in understanding at the molecular level how that virus infects the liver and why does this infect the liver and it doesn't infect the heart or it doesn't infect other tissues. Higher interest rates have knocked investors' confidence in putting their money into property, evidence suggests. The insurance company Standard Life says that the rate rises since last summer have led more people to question the wisdom of property investment. Most patients with type 2 diabetes should start taking statins, the cholesterol-fighting drugs, as a preventative measure against heart disease, whether or not they have high cholesterol levels according to new guidelines released yesterday. The recommendations from the American College of Physicians call for moderate doses of statins by people with diabetes who are older than 55 and for younger patients who have any other risk factors for heart disease, like high blood pressure or history of smoking. The new guidelines are outlined in April 20th issue of the Annals of Internal Medicine, in an article that noted that about 16 million Americans have type 2 diabetes, and that 800,000 new cases are diagnosed every year. The lead author of an article accompanying the guidelines Dr. Sandeep Vijan of the University of Michigan said that almost everyone with type 2 diabetes should be on a statin. The average age at diagnosis is 48, and even many patients under 55 have high blood pressure as well as diabetes, he said. Traditionally, diabetes treatment has focused on regulating blood sugar levels by careful control of diet or through insulin injections. But researchers have come to understand that control sugar really protects only against the destruction of small blood vessels, which can lead to blindness or loss of fingers, toes, or limbs. Heart disease is, in fact, the more serious threat. Up to 80% of diabetes patients will develop heart problems or die of them, the article said. And Dr. Vijan emphasized that controlling hypertension remained the highest priority. He ranked control of lipids, the fats in the bloodstream that can affect coronary health, second ahead of glucose regulation. China will become the world's safest and largest investment economy in times to come, given the following factors. Huge market potential, rich labor resources, comparative advantage in labor cost, sound corporate governance, and stable government and society. All these factors will further attract the inflow of foreign capital into China. In short, China's economy will grow even faster in the future. In the next 15 years, China's economy will still increase at a rate of 7% to 8%. In the year 2020, should price index remain the same as today, GDP will amount to U.S. $4.8 trillion. GDP per capita will reach U.S. $3,300. However, the level of GDP per capita is still very low in China at the moment. GDP per capita's growth is still at a slow rate. GDP per capita will have to be further increased in order to raise China's standard of living so as to bridge the present income gap between the rich and the poor. Satisfaction of consumers' needs can be the main driver in raising China's living standards. Domestic demand will increase as the economy grows. Therefore, extensive production of goods and services can further push and sustain the economy's growth. Moreover, 
There are abundant human resources in China, and labor cost in China is much lower than the other industrialized countries. China's education system is also being fast developed. Thus, more people will achieve higher level of education than in the past. With comparative advantage in cheap labor cost and increase of human capital brought about by education, future for China's economy can be only even brighter.